Court is now in session for another episode of Innocent Until Proven Guilty. It's October and Halloween is just around the corner, so I feel the need to tackle a game that's appropriate for the season. This one is an extra special IUPG in that it's the first viewer request for this show. This particular title wasn't on my radar at all. I've owned this for a while, but I was unaware of its reputation until Michael B. the Game Genie asked me to review it. Mike was persistent about wanting to see this go to trial, so I figured this was the perfect time to fulfill his request. Without further ado, here's what's considered to be one of the worst entries in the NES library, Swamp Thing. Swamp Thing was unleashed into the world by DC Comics in 1971, the series had a brief run in the early to mid 70s, but it wasn't until 1982 when the feature film of the same name came out that the creature became a lasting part of pop culture. The movie was a success and spawned a sequel and two shows in the early 90s, as well as the topic of this IUPG. Swamp Thing for the NES was released late in the system's lifespan in December 1992. It was developed by a Imagineering Inc. and published by THQ. The intro cinematic introduces us to a man named Alec Holland, the biochemist shacked up deep in the Louisiana Bayou in order to create a plant growth formula in the hopes of eliminating world hunger. However, Anton Arcane, a mad scientist, has other plans in mind. He steals the formula to use for his own selfish needs and attempts to kill Holland in the process via a bomb. Unfortunately for Arcane, the plan didn't go as expected. Alec was caught in the explosion, but he wasn't killed. Instead, the chemicals from the lab and the muck from the bayou merged with his body, changing him into the titular star. I'll give Imagineering Inc. props for everything seen so far, including that badass looking title screen. This is note for note the character's origin story from the comic and it sets the perfect mood for what's to come. Pressing start unravels more of the plot. Arcane indicates that the amount of stolen formula was insufficient, so he sends out Dr. Demo, one of the sinister unmen, to capture Swamp Thing and learn his secrets to gain immortality. Demo is transformed by Arcane in a Rita Repulsa-esque manner and stage one begins. My initial impressions with the presentation were favorable overall. The sprites and backgrounds, as well as the soundtrack by Mark Van Heck, are all very nice. The controls are simple and standard standard for the NES, A jumps and B attacks. However, when we take a deeper look into the play mechanics, some serious flaws are revealed underneath the pretty picture. Immediately apparent upon controlling DC's resident mutant is that he moves really, really slowly. On the side-scrolling slowness scale, I'd say he's second to Dr. Jekyll. Nobody can compete with Jekyll's sluggish pace, but Swamp Thing comes close. It is possible to increase his speed slightly by holding down A. The extra boost helps out in obtaining the batteries which fall out of dispatched foes. The batteries are essential towards advancing Holland's journey as collecting 20 will add a health point back to the meter and 1-ups are rewarded after 50 are picked up. The downside is that it has no impact on reaching distant ledges. Since both tasks are assigned to the same button, it's literally impossible to do a running leap. It's incredibly awkward and I have no idea how Imagineering Inc. thought this was an intuitive control scheme. Another annoyance that I encountered was in dealing with the enemies. The majority of the enemies are on the small side, and while our hero can punch in a crouching position, he's still too tall to hit them. There are moss projectiles that alleviate this problem a little bit by providing a ranged attack, but these are limited in supply. More often than not, I just decided to hop over them instead of attempting to fist them to death. It was much less aggravating that way. Swamp Thing's quest to stop the wannabe tyrant's bid for immortality takes him through many different environments, from his Louisiana birthplace which is ravaged by robot fish and insects, to a tribal village intent on having old greenie for dinner, the player is tossed immediately into the danger zone and it only gets tougher from here. 
unfortunately, there are one-ups hidden in each level, so keep an eye out for those. We'll need as much help as we can get for later on. The Cannibal Menace transitions to a ghastly graveyard and the spooky quotient is sufficiently filled here. As a warning, the undead adversaries can't be harmed, so don't even try. Dodging or ducking under the ghouls and ghosts leads to Dr. Demo. Demo is a piece of cake. Simply punch him when he materializes until he's down for the count. Upon Demo's demise, Arcane sends his next unmen, Weed Killer, to finish the job, and the setting shifts to the Chemical Factory. The Chemical Factory was the bane of my existence for the longest time, and the main source of frustration wasn't an enemy or boss, but the jumping! First of all, the Green Brute's leaps are accompanied with an irritating tone. Wait a minute, that reminds me of something, but what is it? Oh, I know! Bart versus the Space Mutants! In fact, the damage chime is exactly the same! That's odd. Is there a connection between these two licensed properties? Eat my short. Let's check the credits. Well, look at that! Space Mutants was also developed by Imagineering Inc! The wiki for the franchise states that Imagineering Inc. reused the engine from the Acclaim release, which explains why this has a similar feel to The Simpsons tie-in. Regardless, the jumping is a big issue, and the lack of speed makes it worse! You have to wait to leap until the edge of a platform to have any chance of landing some of the trickier sections. On top of this, the safe zones can be practically microscopic! If a jump is missed by even a fraction of an inch, the protagonist can fall right through the platforms! Even worse, there were spots where I somehow slid off the edge of the intended target into oblivion below! I'm very forgiving of games and their quirks, but that right there is total BS! Managing to overcome all of these hurdles leads to Weed Killer, who literally sprays pesticide in our general direction. This fight isn't that hard. Remain patient and wait until the best opportunity to deck him in the face presents itself. Once he's out of the way, we're introduced to the final unmanned Skin Man via a cutscene. The ensuing forest area is straightforward, but I would highly suggest grinding for lives here by killing the respawnable bats. Trust me when I say they'll be needed later on. The junkyard and toxic dump that follow are lighter on platforming than the preceding segments, but heavy on the hazards such as pulverizing pistons and acidic pits. Luckily, I received some aid in the form of an apple and a flower. No joke, our hero can enter the aforementioned items by pressing up and exit them via the select button. The flower completely refills the health bar and the apple allows him to stealthily avoid baddies, but he can still be hurt while possessing them. It didn't matter to me though because I was grateful for any kind of relief at that point. The Wasteland concludes with the battle against Skin Man. The humanoid bat flies back and forth out of reach and drops projectiles onto the green guardian below. Our course of action is naturally to give him a taste of his own medicine, which is enacted via the trees in the background. Press up to inhabit them similarly to the apple and B to return the favor. Switch between the trees via the D-pad, continue to spam B, and Skin Man will be swiftly wiped out. With the humiliating defeat of the Unmen, Arcane readies his mansion for the arrival of his nemesis and it's time for the last stand. This is where I would normally put on the spoiler warning, but sadly, it's not necessary for this video because, well, I couldn't beat it. I gave it my all and it wasn't good enough. The evil doctor's lair is a death trap, plain and simple. I had seven lives stocked up and one of the two total continues remaining, but his defenses quickly decimated them and soon enough, it was over. I've beaten The Nightmare on Elm Street, Sunday Fun Day, Bucky O'Hare, and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I've got the skills to overcome challenges, but this was beyond me. I noticed that the GameFAQs community rated this as unforgiving on the difficulty scale when I was doing research. 
I was skeptical about this initially, but they were absolutely right. Swamp Thing truly is one of the hardest games of all time, but that doesn't mean that it's horrible. That's for the breakdown to determine, so let's head over there now! Imagineering Inc. clearly had no idea what they were doing, since Swamp Thing is a nearly broken mess. All of the fundamental elements that make a quality entry in the genre are absent here. The title character moves too slow, has a weak attack, and his jumping ability is awful! It's almost as if they wanted the player to suffer since the brutal difficulty ensures that there is no joy to be had with this. Action 52 is more fun than this, and that's considered to be the worst that the NES had to offer, so that's saying something. Imagineering Inc. were a bunch of sadists and their creation is guilty beyond a doubt. Out. Yes, Swamp Thing has a few problems, but there are some redeeming qualities about it. The sprites and backgrounds are nicely detailed and colorful, looking like they're ripped out of the comic. Speaking of which, Imagineering Inc. did a great job of remaining faithful to the source material, so for that, I give them respect. Plus, they based this off of the engine from a childhood favorite of mine, so that has to count for something. Swamp Thing is flawed, this is true, but I appreciate it for what it is. I mean, the fact that there is a Swamp Thing video game is cool in and of itself. It may have issues, but I'm glad that it exists. In the case of Swamp Thing, I rule that the verdict is... GUILTY! Faithfulness to the source material aside, this license tie-in fails in every category. I love a good challenge as much as anybody, but this is the wrong kind of challenge. The difficulty here is primarily due to bad design choices. It shouldn't be possible to slide off a platform, yet it happened on multiple occasions during my capture session. I mentioned previously that there's no fun to be had here, and that is absolutely true. Of all the IUPG cases so far, this provided the least enjoyment and nearly broke me. This guilty verdict is my most severe to date, and I suggest you stay far away from this game for the sake of your sanity. Anyway, now that I have that unpleasantness behind me, I have a special Cygnus Destroyer episode planned for next week. Come back for that, but until then, court is now adjourned! Thanks for watching everyone. Like I said before, come back next week for a special Cygnus Destroyer video, but until then, you can check out these videos on the screen right here. On the upper left hand corner, that is last week's LJN Defender on Bill and Ted's excellent Game Boy Adventure. Not excellent video game adventure, mind you. Not the NES one, the Game Boy one. I'm not ready to do the NES one yet. It's just, that game is, I'm just completely intimidated by that game, so I just can't handle it yet. But uh, yeah, the Game Boy one, check that out because that's actually a pretty good game, surprisingly. So yeah, the episode was a lot of fun to work on and the game, I had a lot of fun playing that too. So definitely check that out. Now for the other videos, I'm gonna go with the Halloween theme here. So both of them work like that. So the one on the upper right is another Innocent Till Proven Guilty on the infamous Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. That was one of the earliest IAPGs that I did. I knew that would be a pretty epic one to tackle and I was right. I had a blast making that video and actually sticking up for that game the best I could, but I don't want to spoil anything because that doesn't mean that I gave it an innocent. You'll have to watch that to find out. Now, in the bottom left hand corner, that is a Cygnus Destroyer review for Typing of the Dead for the Sega Dreamcast. I enjoy typing and I love those games, the House of the Dead the games, those che cheesy horror games, so that was just so fun. I just love that. My first Dreamcast review, love the Dreamcast. Gonna do more Dreamcast reviews in the future, so yeah, definitely check those out to get more in the Halloween spooky vibe. And as always, for anyone who's new to the channel, if you like what you saw and you want to see more, click that red box right there on the bottom right and that'll subscribe you to the channel and you'll be able to keep up to date with all my current content. So like I said before, come back next week for a special Signus Destroyer video, but until then, I will talk to you guys later. Bye bye!